Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Restored Tomorrow. We are Clinton Charity Munoz, your host, and we are so excited for you guys to get to know our guest today, Dr. Glenn and Phyllis Hill. All right, let me dive in here. Dr. Glenn is a marriage and family therapist, clinical sexologist, connection codes coach, and author with a private practice in Nashville, Tennessee. Phyllis, his wife, is an entrepreneur, connection codes coach, and according to Glenn, the engine that keeps everything running. I can amen to that one for sure about charity. Uh, the pain of their early married, married years, along with the decades of research and experience, led the Hills to founding the Connection Codes. They provide counseling to couples, families, individuals, churches, and businesses in helping people build a deeper connection. They have witnessed the Connection Codes help heal and enrich countless lives and relationships. Both Glenn and Phyllis, their mission is to take Connection Codes to every corner of the globe. So hopefully we can help you do that. Uh, yeah. actors, dive into our listeners. Thank you guys for being with us today. We're so thankful for you guys taking the time. Oh my goodness. We just love it. And yeah. we are always thrilled to be invited to share our story, mm -hmm. uh, which is how all of this started with our story. Yeah. And, you know, Connection Codes grew out of that. So yeah. we love these opportunities. Yeah. Cool. Well, why don't we just start there? I mean, you almost opened it up perfectly, Phyllis. I think all of us, all of us have a story of brokenness, right? So many of us are working through our brokenness and you guys, you allowed God to use your brokenness to create something amazing. Why don't we just start with your guys' story that you, we kind of hit on in that intro, but let's yeah. elaborate on that. Well, Glenn and I met when I was 15 and he was 16. We, we, met, we met at a summer camp. I hit her in the head with a softball and she <laughs> never. Yeah. Yeah. She's still deliriously in love. It's yes. <laughs> and we dated for four years, mostly long distance. And yeah. we thought we had all the ingredients, mm -hmm. you know, just as far as our love for God, our knowledge of the word, our, you know, involvement with mm -hmm. church, with ministry and you know christian college like the whole nine yards and even before we got married we both had full-time jobs we were even able to buy our first house mm -hmm. so you go oh on paper it looked really really good and that's what we believed you know we went into our wedding kind of that magical wedding that mm -hmm. perfect wedding glenn sang to me as i walked down the aisle songs that i had written yes wow. which I to her the night before 11 yeah. 30 p.m mm. yeah. she struggled a little bit <laughs> yeah he wanted me to say, well we sang our vows and i think i did stumble a bit through that mm. but uh it was just one of those moments you know and mm. our closest friends and family were there and glenn had planned the perfect honeymoon and you know through our dating life we very much had had a goal of purity now we kept moving the line you know the line kept moving from when we first started dating and you know actually the, before our wedding we kind of did a whole like we're not going to even kiss we're not even going to hold hands for the six months before our wedding it was like we wanted so much to be focused and go in with purity into our marriage and um you know so we uh, even though we had moved the line previously we had never uh, cross the line, you know, the line that you're not supposed to cross. So we had never put tab A into slot B. Yeah. Like that yeah. was the one big thing. And it was the, okay, this is the wedding gift. This mm -hmm. is the ultimate wedding gift. And that's about all we'd ever heard. Not much more. We never were really taught anything mm -hmm. about sex and we had never had any conversations with anyone before the wedding, but we thought we would just be able to figure it out and knew kind of mechanically what to do. Mm -hmm. But on our wedding night, when the, when we finally opened the wedding gift, for me, it was absolutely devastating. Yeah. It was the greatest 11 seconds of my life, so I didn't know. <laughs> but we did it. It was spectacular. And now we wow. the whole, we did it, now we get to do it again. And I was and like, again. Yeah. And, and again. And I'm like, no, thank wow. you. I that That was so disappointing. And I really felt almost like, I had been lied to mm -hmm. and I was just like, that was not fun. No. And it, yeah. And so we, even though Glenn had planned the perfect honeymoon, we were at a honeymoon resort in the Pocono mountains in Pennsylvania. And, you know, everything was geared towards that mirrors everywhere mm -hmm. and, you know, red velvet, uh, bedspreads and the whole nine yards. Mm -hmm. But I was like, no, thank you. Mm -hmm. 
And we did a lot of water skiing on our honeymoon because she figured out if we're on a boat with other people, probably pretty safe. And so oh. I didn't know I'd married a water ski a holic. <laughs> so we would have breakfast and she'd go, let's get Let's on the boat I was like, right, again. So wow. that's mostly what we did on our honeymoon. Okay. So I got to ask a question. Did you guys talk about that? Or, I mean, there must've been like, like some, after, after, after the first, you know, a and B it happened. Would, would, and let's just, our, our audience is super open. So we're just going to use terms. <laughs> okay, so you guys are saying vaginal sex, right? Is what you didn't have. You had vaginal sex. Phyllis, can I ask, was it painful for you? Was it, emotional what, what was it that made it so like oh my gosh i hate this i don't want to do this anymore can i ask you what that was for you sure yeah i think that for me uh it wasn't it was more that you know when we were dating and we had like that line we wouldn't cross mm. but we would do everything else so i would get incredibly turned on yeah. and then when it was finally our wedding night it was like oh we don't need to do any of that mm. we're just gonna you know very quickly get to that point, get to that thing that we've been waiting on. And so, yeah, I mean, it wasn't painful as in mind blowing. It was more emotional. Like that was not orgasmic at all. That was not pleasurable at all. Wow. And somehow I thought that it would be like, I thought it would be magical. And so, yeah, it was just very disappointing. And no, I didn't know how to talk about it. I did not know how to say to Glenn, uh, something's wrong here or that that wasn't fun. Yeah. It was like I ha I didn't have the language. I just froze in it yeah. and avoided it. Yeah, we were both clueless. Um, I had learned a fair amount from my fellow third graders some years before. <laughs> and, um, I was startled to find out some of that information was not accurate. Uh, and I had never told Phyllis that I knew everything, that I understood everything, but I would never told her that I didn't. And she just kind of assumed that I did. And so, I, you know, we go into the whole well, scenario. Well, and I'm thinking you just put tab A in the slot B and you live halfway over after and we had no clue and we had never had conversations with anybody else mm -hmm. about it, which of course wow. then led us to coming back from our honeymoon, not having conversations yeah. with anybody else about mm -hmm. it. So we suffered in silence for a long time. And I'm, ass I'm assuming, did you, there's probably two other options. You withdrew and you guys weren't sexually intimate that often, or you had sex, but then you it became like a task. It was or a task and yeah. a duty because that was an obligation. It's culturally, you know, that's now what you do when you're a Christian married couple. Well, it's both of those. Yeah, uh -huh. it's both. I mean, yeah. I definitely felt that, oh, we're married. This is what we're supposed to do. But it was like, I never wanted to. Hmm. And so then it would usually start with a fight, an argument. And then, you know, but then again, out of, duty it was like well you're supposed to and but yeah i mean definitely i avoided even you know it's interesting because it sets you up so horribly that then i didn't even want to snuggle i didn't even want to um show affection of any kind because i was so fearful that that would lead to yeah something more and so i became very cold and very distant and yet we were very much living life right so all of a sudden you're sharing a house and you're you know you're newly married and you're trying to stay attached to your friends and uh you know it it was just this whirlwind of pain for me of not knowing who to trust who to talk to and just to get basic advice like basically like somehow we're missing just something very basic hmm. But I would say very quickly, we determined I was broken. Hmm. That was the problem. So I was, I just, can, I, can I add something there, Phil? Sorry to cut you off. I just, I just wanted to, so I'm hearing this and I, and I'm, man, I'm getting like sad because I, I can feel the pain. Mm, yeah. And in my mind, the minute you say your story, there are literally thousands, if not millions of couples yeah. that yeah. are your story. And it's not just the wife that is hurt, that feels lied to. It's the husband that's like, well, wait a minute, this gift that we saved, this right. is terrible. My wife won't let me hold her hand. She won't let me give her a back rub. In fact, I kiss her on the neck and she's like, hey, this isn't going to lead anywhere, right? Because that's what you're saying. And so 
as a husband and wife, we both can feel like we were completely lied to. And there's so much confusion there because when we were dating, it's hot and heavy, right? I mean, as you're saying, you guys are pushing that line. So you're like, all right, well, okay. We can all know what that means, right? You're, you're, we're going here, we're going there. So there's this anticipation, this excitement about, okay, when we get married, we're going to, we're going to hold off on this to save this. And then it's so disappointing. You know, I'm going to ask a personal question, Phyllis. I was curious for you, when you guys had vaginal sex, were you climaxing as well? Or was it just, just Glenn that was climaxing? Like most couples, like a guy just gets in there and does his thing, climaxes, and that's it. Is that what sex was kind of for you guys? Or was it different than that? Well, let's go back to the the point that Glenn made. Uh, it was 11 seconds. So yeah. I'll let you guess whether I climaxed or Oh, yeah. She, yeah. she had orgasm three or four times in the 11 seconds. Yeah. <laughs> Thank I you for like the movies. Oh. Not at all. Yeah. I mean, it was a total, like, miss. Mm -hmm. And... Mm -hmm. And so it was the, and not to say that while we were dating and making out, that was a common thing. And it was almost like there were probably over those four years moments where I got turned on enough and we were playing inappropriately enough that we got there, but it wasn't even like, oh, this is how you really do this. Sure. It's like, I didn't know my own body. I didn't know what felt good. I didn't know how to even express that. Yeah. And I think we both believed that you achieve that through uh, vaginal sex. And so it was like, oh, that didn't happen for me. It happened for you. So that's where the whole, you're broken. You must just right. be broken. Yeah, and that was the big thing. We were just so clueless because I'm, and I would love to say not for a bad heart. I don't know that it was for a bad heart, but I'm just like, this is so easy. What's the deal here? My gosh. Yeah. What? What is your problem? Sure. Why won't you sign on to this? Well, let's just yeah. party. Let's just have fun. Again, mm -hmm. I was completely clueless because some of my fellow third graders didn't have a clue either. And I was kind of mad at Phyllis because I felt lied to. But more than that, I was mad at God. Mm -hmm. And I remember by the end of our honeymoon, just thinking, I just signed a 70-year contract. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, I was 20 years old. I'm thinking probably yeah. seven years. Are you kidding me? You know, and we have already done the tab A and slot B, so we can't get an annulment. So what? Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know how long 70 years was. No, but I'm like, no. that sounds like a really long time. And it just escalated and got worse and worse over the coming weeks and Gosh. months. And I'm just, I'm despondent. Yeah. And again, it was so painful, so unbearable for Phyllis, but it was for me too. And I'm not, I don't blame her for that because we were both just clueless. Mm. I had no idea what. I'd signed on to and how this had happened. Okay. So right there is so key because that connects to couples with our stories so much. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden the guy then reverts the common story here. The guy then reverts to pornography because his wife doesn't want sex. He's now going other places. And we think the problem is with sex. Right. And so the pastor or, or counselor says, okay, well, you know, wife, if you just have more sex with Bob, then, then Bob would be able to orgasm and then he'd feel better about himself. But really, I, we, what we've seen is that we're, pornography is just a symptom to an, a deeper problem. Yeah. So we're just going to pornography, not because we need sex. We know that sex is not a biological need, but we're so in pain as a husband that our wife is completely rejecting us that we're mm -hmm. going to go somewhere to just feel loved and accounted for. And you don't fix that problem with sex. You fix it with connection. Am I right? So I want to hear about that. I mean, this, I just think there's all these couples that we talk to and the husband's mad at the wife and the wife's mad at the husband because, or they're mad at God. And in reality, there's just this communication that isn't mm. taking place. You guys talk about how our emotions, maybe we should not label them good or bad, but we should mm -hmm. almost like use them as indicators. Absolutely. Yeah. Can you, can you kind of segue into that a little bit? So you guys have these emotions and your emotions that you're telling us you experienced there, there are couples experiencing these right now. Mm -hmm. How can they look at these emotions and almost like use them yeah. to move yeah. forward versus yeah. divide? Well, you just fast forwarded. Oh. Yeah, you did. Oh, yeah. Just, sorry. I'm sorry. I got excited. Oh, I'm excited. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Maybe a little, maybe a little segue is to, to let yeah. the audience know we've been married now 40 years this July. Wow. So we've lived a lot of life and it took, it took years to get even just enough sexual knowledge mm -hmm. 
to actually turn it into mm. something pleasurable. Mm. So it took a long time to actually mm. trust the process, to learn just mm. the mechanics yeah. and to understand how men think, how women think, mm. how men's bodies work, how women body, like we just had to really, um, but we'd already done so much damage. Mm. So there was yeah. so much pain in the early years of our marriage mm because of the wounding, the sexual wounding is so, so deep. And yes, you, you actually fast forwarded incredibly to where we get to live now. No, that's good. Cause we only have so much time. You know, it, it's interesting because part of our experience was about 10 years in when we were actually doing better. Um, we liked each other. We enjoyed each other. We had good, sexual chemistry 10 years in but then all of a sudden we were looking around and our friends all of our high school college friends were divorcing mm. and we were just devastated for sure mm. uh and so sad and confused like mm. goodness we survived hell and back how yeah. in the world are y'all giving up on this we just couldn't figure out what happened with them that didn't happen with us because you know once you're maxed out on pain you're just maxed out on pain and so we began asking questions initially kind of out of morbid curiosity and then it became a quest and then our mission and now it's our passion but initially and i don't claim to understand the spirit of god this may have been a spirit of god moment because we asked the follow-up questions of so people would we'd say what happened they tell oh, we grew apart usually that's it like, oh well, okay yeah you grew apart but we'd ask the follow-up question like wait what does that mean like on a tuesday at four i mean what, what do you mean you grew apart at some point you grew together that's why you voluntarily went on the second date and the third date and you showed up on your wedding day so what does that mean you grew apart and we started asking and analyzing that and you know we, people would say oh we fell out of love and we'd be like sunday at six i mean what does that mean you fell out of love because at some point i guess allegedly you fell in love so at some point you fell out of love and so that just began a very, we had no idea. We didn't have a mission statement or a business plan for the connection codes, but that over many, many years uh, evolved and morphed into what we now call the connection codes because, and again, fast forwarding a bit uh, through a lot of life events and what happened certainly with us, but also even vocationally, uh, Phyllis made me quit working. She made me go to uh, back to school and uh, I think stunning that everything that all the benchmarks in our life are because of her. Cause, I'm the educated one, she's the smart one. <laughs> and um, he made me quit working. I was a contractor, not a very good one. I worked hard, but I was very inefficient in, in business. But we began just uh, researching and experimenting. And most of that was mostly my focus, just figure out what causes people to disconnect. This doesn't make any sense. These two are hot and heavy, so excited about being together. They date, they go on a second date, the third, they marry what happened mm -hmm. this doesn't make any sense what causes people to disconnect i've never been to a wedding where that was part of the vows you know yeah um, i'm going to be totally into you for six months maybe two years and then our relationship will dissipate into some level of lawness and then we'll just bite down on a stick and, and endure the torment or something i've never heard that i've been to a lot of weddings so i wanted to find out what happens and we now know what causes people to disconnect scientifically uh, not not from a philosophical or, or theoretical viewpoint, but literally scientifically we know. Well, and again, Phyllis figures out all this stuff. So when we finally figured that out, when they, she said, well, wait a minute, if that's what causes people to disconnect, if you turn that upside down, isn't that what causes people to connect? Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah, yeah, I already, I knew that. I figured that. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, it can't be true. It can't be that clear. It can't be that mm -hmm. simple but it is wow. that again morphed a bit into what we now call the connection codes as uh, connection because it's about connection about relationships it's also coding because this is already inside of us now we're both faith-based you know we believe that god designed us but even if it's evolutionary mm -hmm. if humans just evolved this way it's still true it's mm -hmm. the human condition now, you don't have to believe in god to believe that humans breathe oxygen they do <laughs> no, 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 I don't believe in oxygen. Like, well, still true. <laughs> we now know this is how we get these two connected, and it blo and the fact that we get to live it blows our minds because we remember the pain. We know uh, again. I'd love to say thirty years ago, really, just about 
12, 15 years ago, the, because we're old, um, just the intensity of the pain. And it's just stunning to me that it's this simple. It's not easy, but it is pretty darn simple. Mm -hmm. Remarkable. Well, when you fast forward, you mentioned just emotionally connected. Mm -hmm. And, you mm -hmm. know, because actually once we started getting, uh, things figured out, we thought, oh, if you have sexual connection, that's all you need. Mm. And then we learned, no, no, you got to have an emotional connection that starts your marriage, mm. your relationship, and then you can build on that sexual connection. And so, you know, earlier, uh, Charity, you asked if I was able to talk to Glenn, like on the honeymoon, mm. was I able to say to him what I was experiencing? And the answer is clearly no. And that is what the language of the connection codes teaches. It teaches you the actual language to be able to express what's happening for you, to give you that, those, the words and, and even the safety where, you know, I retreated into myself because I felt safe inside myself. And I did not understand that I actually uh, you know, emotions are a human right, mm -hmm. but that's not what I was taught. I was taught as a young girl to be quiet and do not express mm -hmm. your needs. Uh, matter of fact, don't even have needs. Mm -hmm. Just, you mm -hmm. know, just do. I was a doer. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's, it, it works a lot even with, depending on your, your heritage, your religious heritage that, mm -hmm. you know, the good deeds led to heaven. You know, it's mm -hmm. like I was definitely on that road of good deeds. And so, this disconnect with Glenn on the honeymoon was my cross to bear. It was my pain to bear. It was not for me to try to have the language to discuss it. And I kind of walked away from it going, well, this is what all women go through. We just don't talk about it. Wow. And that, you know, you are just to grin and bear it. This is now what you do as a wife. And, you know, the pleasure we only found before we were married, when we were sinning and going too far. Mm -hmm. And so it, it all made sense. And so part of our story and the, and all the research, it's like we figured out, okay, just because we finally figured some stuff out sexually. And I finally figured out what an orgasm was after five, six years of marriage. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, I'm not broken. That was number one. Wow. Mm -hmm. I'm not broken. We just were not doing it right. You know, like logistically not doing it right. Well, then we realized you got to still have emotional connection mm -hmm. and the language. Like that has been the biggest thing, even in the last decade of our marriage, is being able to say to each other what is happening because we still are as different today as mm -hmm. we were the day we married. Mm -hmm. And we just see different. You know, I always think about like when we go to the movies, I'll look at them, I'll watch a movie and go, oh, Gosh, that was so sweet and that was the saddest movie ever and then glenn goes what oh my god <laughs> what was that about that movie? I didn't... and so we can see a movie and not even experience the same emotion mm. and so what fires in my brain and fires in his brain in the mm. very same moment mm. is different and so for me to have the language to go whoa man yeah. i am feeling really sad about that email and glenn goes oh Man, I thought it was fantastic. I'm feeling a lot of joy about that email. And that we have that space for each other, which also helps so, so much in that to remind each other, our story doesn't change. Mm. The pain of our story does not go away. It doesn't change. Mm. But now I have a language that when I go there, even now, like in the last week, for me to be able to go, Ooh, I'm feeling some fear about bringing this up. Oh, Glenn goes, mm. What's the fear? Mm. I might have missed something. And then I can say, well, I was just thinking back to, you know, our honeymoon. Mm. And, and I just remember this really painful moment that we mm. had, that fight in that restaurant. And he'll yeah. go, oh, yeah, cool. man, Ooh, I get that. Mm. And all of a sudden, I'm safe, mm. re, re able to share with him a pain that for some odd reason, came flashing back into my mind. Maybe it was a scene in a, in a movie or something I read or a picture. You know, every once in a while, it's incredible how now with technology, on your phone, a picture can pop up that's a memory. And sometimes it's a painful memory. And so your brain inspires like crazy that pain again, that, that, that vacation you had where you had the biggest fight of your marriage. And for you to have the language to go, oh, I just got hit with so much sadness and 
and hurt and loneliness. And then for your partner to tune in and go, oh, whoa, what's happening? And then you have the language and that's part of the, you know, the power of the connection codes is that we want to be able to help you to have the language to share with each other yeah. what's happening for you, which a lot of that is based on science. It's mm. learning that your brain houses emotion. Mm. That was life changing for me. Yeah. I had no idea that I had that in my brain. Yeah. I thought emotions were an option. Mm. You can use them or leave them. And I chose to leave them. Mm. I just was a very productive person, human, adult. And I was like, nah, Glenn has enough emotion for both of us. Mm. I don't need to do emotion. Yeah. Mm. Well, that's not, that's lie. That's a lie. Mm. And your body stores the emotion if you don't let that emotion out. Mm. And eventually your body gets really yeah. mad and says mm. no more. Yeah. Wow. You just hit on so wow. many like key points that we believe in. Like, oh my gosh. Um, and, and there's a book for you right there. <laughs> yeah. No kidding. It's so good. But that it's was just, amazing. It, Everything you said was just so true. Uh, I feel like it just resonates so much with you, Phyllis, and um, in different ways, of course, yet very similar and um, very much a doer. And when we got married, I mean, I would joke with him. I don't know if you guys have seen the holiday with Cameron Diaz, but when she like finally doesn't cry at the very end, that was me in our relationship. He's like, please just like cry. And I'm like, I can't. And then when I did, I'm like, yay. But there's so much, you know, shoved down there. And when I finally could put language to betrayal trauma and what was going on in our relationship after discovery day, it was healing for me. And it was healing for him because if you don't have a language, then how is he supposed to know how to come alongside you? You know, if I couldn't even understand what was going on with myself, how could I share that with him. So that helped so much. And I just, I love what you guys are saying because you're talking about becoming a safe person for your spouse. And that is like the biggest thing that we are about is becoming that safe person for your spouse in the season. Do you want to say? Well, yeah, I I think, yeah, we talk about safety a lot because the goal of our, the relationships that we coach and help a lot are let's get to safety, let's get safety, which is so important. But what I hear you saying is it's more, it's, there's a component of that that you guys have really capitalized on with the years of science-based research you've done, the experience, and that is learning how to communicate our emotions and Mm -hmm. understand the language of how to listen for emotion and even voice our emotion. So my, my question to you guys is, as you guys counsel couples and you coach these couples, if you could narrow it down to what is holding them back from experience that connection, is it that they can't communicate their emotions? They don't feel free to communicate their emotions. What, how would you word that? Looking at the people you you coach, I mean, is is would you maybe there's not like one pivotal thing, but it sounds like there's a lot of this communication around emotions that we just don't know how to do. We're not taught how to do it. It's not even example exemplified for us in our in our families. Hmm. Talk to me. What are you guys thinking there? Yeah, it's authenticity. Mm. That's it. Um, you have children? Yeah, three little boys. You have three. Uh, what ages? Five, three, and two. Okay, they're they're your coaches. Yeah, they're, they're your connection connection coach coaches because they will show you how to do this. Mm-hmm. If you especially your two year old, if you watch your two year old, hundred percent authentic all the time. What's his name? The two year old? Chase. Chase. You never have to wonder what's happening with Chase. That's you true. always know. And again, I'm faith-based. I believe God designed Chase this way. So he's just being authentic. And you don't have to get him up every morning and say, okay, Chase, now we're going to try to be authentic today. You're going to have <laughs> needs, and I want you to convey those needs to, to mommy. Let daddy know what's happening with you. You never have to do that. And when Chase fin- finishes his day, he's done. He has mm-hmm. processed everything and he's not going to bed until he does. Wow. You notice this? Yeah. <laughs> and it's he true. doesn't care what time the clock it's is. <laughs> but Chase's psyche, Chase's body goes, no, no, mm-hmm. no, it's not time to sleep yet. It's, <laughs> we've got to get all this stuff processed first. Mm-hmm. Well, Clinton is just like, Chase, he just had a bunch more birthdays, but that never changed. Mm-hmm. But that never changed for charity, never changed for Glenn or Phyllis. We just had a bunch more birthdays. But there's no birthday where we go in and we rewire your brain mm-hmm. so that your coding is different. You got reprogrammed along the way, the software, 
but you never got recoded. The hardware is the same. It always has been. It always will be. So if we get people authentic, like Chase is all the time, and we get Clinton able to turn to charity. Now, there's a whole bunch of nuances in that. I get that. But if we can get this guy to turn to this girl and let her know what's happening with him authentically, they will connect. Mm. Now, Charity may get hit with her own emotions, and we need – she's a human too. She's not a cyborg or a computer or a mannequin. So we have to get her to be able to, in that moment, also be authentic and say, oh, I feel a lot of pain when you say that thing mm. that you just shared. I mean, she has the, the right to exist. She has the right to experience what she experiences. She has the right to convey that experience. But we get them down to the level of authenticity. And that was one of the fundamental scientific parts of the Connection Codes research is recognizing this, that humans are designed to connect. Mm -hmm. It is not from birth. And again, you watch people with babies. We just connect with babies. What do you care? You don't know who this 10-month-old is. <laughs> oh, you just see the baby and you're like, oh, look, it's so cute. What do you care? You've never seen that baby before. It's just in the <laughs> But that's because babies feel safe mm. for us and they feel authentic. Wow. And I love the science of the brain. Mm. And, and I know for me, this has been so transformational, the science behind the brain. And to realize mm. that, you know, the curiosity, I want to know what my mm. brain is firing. Mm. And, you know, we have five neural mm. regions that house the emotion. So it's not 150,000. Mm. No, it's five. It's just five mm. neural mm. regions of mm. the brain. And so we have complicated emotion terribly. Mm. And I think that part of what with the connection codes, we want to bring it back to simplicity mm. and we want it to be simple enough that anyone of any age can use the tools. And of any the, culture. Yes. Any That's culture true. with any language yeah. can use the tool tools of the connection codes. Yeah. And, you know, when you think about the brain, I love the fact, the idea of that there are um, neuro regions, right? So it's like pathways. There's pathways in your brain. And a lot of those pathways are formed because of, of situations within our childhood and into our adulthood. And it's it's realizing, okay, so I need a tool to change the pathways, to start new pathways. And you know, one of the tools that we have developed is called the core emotion wheel. It's a four minute tool for two people to engage in tuning into your brain and then to be able to communicate what is happening in your brain. And we see unbelievable experiences when people use that tool. We were together with a group of couples. We had an opportunity to do an event um, this past weekend in someone's home. It was very intimate. It was an incredible experience. And we did the wheel in front of the crowd and then we had them each do it with someone either that they came with or someone else in the room, it was magical, absolutely magical. And then afterwards we just said, what, what happened for you guys? And some people started experience, you know, just sharing. And, and these are married couples. Everyone there was, you know, married and people would say, he just shared something with me. I've never heard before. Mm. And, or, or just those moments of giving someone the language because mm. part of it, is just like for me, I was so stunted that by the time I was 50, I genuinely had lived a life thinking I don't do emotions. Wow. And my body got really unhappy with me at 50 and started to, you know, kind of shut down to get my attention, which it did. Wow. And it's like, wait, my brain houses emotion. The curiosity of that, I dove in. I'm like, I need to understand. I don't know how to really like when someone says those emotions, you know, uh, fear. I go, oh no, I don't, I don't, not afraid of anything. No fear. And it's like, wait, your brain's firing fear. If I put you on a on a brain scan, it would show it. So you should get to know this about yourself. Yeah. And it was so transformative, and it's helped our relationship so much because I'm able to express instead of through action, I'm actually ex expressing through words what's happening with me. Wow. Where Glenn, I think we spent a, a, a lifetime together just clueless and tiptoeing. Mm -hmm. That's what you yeah. end up doing. Yeah. You tiptoe, oh, don't go near that topic because that causes a, yeah. a fight. You, you begin to tiptoe around each other. And the, with the connection codes, it's a language to share what's happening. Yeah, and again, if you think about Chase, he doesn't tiptoe. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've never met this kid and already know this. Yep. He, 
as you know, it's because he's coded that way. And he's not, and I'm sure he's brilliant if he's your son, but he's not doing that because he's so dang smart that he decided to do it. He's coded mm. that way. It's already inside of him. You know, when he, when he turned a year old, he didn't even go, how am I going to live my life? I think I'll be authentic. <laughs> no, it's just within him. It's automatic. And the trick is people don't need better intentions. They need better mm. tools. Mm. And people have no idea, no idea. And I sit with, I'm a marriage therapist. I sit with couples all the time that they've been married 27 years and they don't have a clue. Mm. And I always liken it to, they've been trying to get a nail into a board. And I mean, they are just expending so much effort and energy and focus, but they're using a broom. Yeah. Mm. So wailing away on this nail with a broom. And they're like, we, I can't try any harder. I'm exhausted. I'm overwhelmed. I want to connect with him, but it never works. We end up wounding each other even more. The more we try to connect, the more. Well, that's because they're beating on this nail with the broom. And then when they get the right tool, well, they're, they're like, well, dang, <laughs> who knew? And they use a hammer and they whack the thing three times. They're like, well, I'm darn. So that's how you get that nail. And, you know, they've gotten the nail in the board a little bit, you know, because they've been beating on it with this hammer for three years. But not, I mean, with this broom, sorry, I messed yeah. up on it. Um, but anyway, once they have the right tools, that's part of what startles us about the connection because when people get the right tools, I mean, since Saturday, we did this event Saturday night. I don't even know how many emails we've gotten from, it wasn't a huge crowd, it was 40, 50 people, but we've gotten so many emails from people going, this has revolutionized everything for us. Mm, wow. I think, well, that was whatever that is. Yeah, it's over 24 hours. Yeah. yeah. That people, and that's what we see, and certainly what we experience, but that's what we see all the time is that it revolutionizes so much, so fast with people. And I believe the reason for that is because it gets them back to their original coding. So they don't have to go learn Latin. You know, Charity, if you'll go learn Latin, become fluent in Latin, you'll be able to connect, you know, with your partner. Well, you could learn Latin. I mean, you're obviously a very intelligent person. How long is it going to take you to learn Latin? I mean, a long dang time. And that's going to be exhausting for you. And you'd be like, oh, my gosh. Okay, well, if it's work, you know, if it means I get to connect with my husband, I'll, I'll go learn Latin. That's exhausting. Yeah. But to say to people, no, 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 you already know this language. This is already inside of you. It's just been suppressed, ignored, kicked aside, whatever. Uh, and that's not, people don't volunteer for that. It's through interactions and events and situations, et cetera, et cetera. We get reprogrammed, not by choice, it's kind of dumped on. But once we reactivate that, mm -hmm. it's unbelievable how quickly, and we always say it's not easy, but it is simple uh, because it's already inside of us. Okay, so we've talked about, I feel like we've talked about one side of the person, the person to sh who is sharing the emotion, right? Well, there's yeah. another person who is sitting there and there's multiple things that happen inside of this person. Normally what ends up happening, I'll just say for us example, if we are, we are not taught how to empathize with their emotions, then we can um, try to fix shame. or we can shame or we can attack them. Mm -hmm. Right. And one of the biggest key things that we are trying to coach and help couples in recovery is for them to feel empathy when they're sharing such big, large emotions, right? Mm -hmm. Because the wife for sure needs so much empathy in knowing that what she's feeling is valid and that she's seen and heard. But normally what yeah. ends up happening is the husband spirals into shame because he feels bad that you know, he's caused this. And it's like, ah, uh, like, you know, I just feel so bad. I'm the one who did it. And, and then that's what happens. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm curious what piece of advice and how are you coaching the other side of the person who's receiving all of these emotions that can be so heavy? Yeah. Well, number one, I diverge with you. I don't think it's the, a wife issue. Uh, I think husband, I, it's just a human issue. Yeah. Uh, I've never met the husband who does not want to feel heard, who does not want to feel seen who does not want to feel safe with his partner. I've never met that mm -hmm. man. I'm not saying they don't exist. I've just never met them. So can you talk about, I'm going to get the ooh. Okay. So, uh, you know, I think that part of it is in sharing emotion, even the way uh, that you were saying that you, one of the two in a relationship has really big emotions. But in all truth, they're, the emotions are firing in the brain of both individuals. Mm -hmm. So often we kind of think that only one has big and the other either doesn't or has small, mm -hmm. but in all truth, 
if you just realize, okay, we both have emotions firing all the time in our brains, we are just not accessing those emotions and we don't have the tools to communicate those emotions on both sides. And, you know, even Charity, the way you kind of described it as in the shame comes in and the spiraling down, mm. but that's part of the beauty of, of the connection codes and, and understanding that having the tool to be able for the other person to express that shame. So there isn't a spiraling down, but that there is room for both. It, it's such a beautiful thing. I mean, even I love the word, you know, empathy, but it almost works on both. When both parties are authentic, there's incredible, you, you're drawn to each other in an incredible way. And, and I go back to the event that we had Saturday night and one of the couples actually shared um, that the husband is over the top successful and just a go getter to the max she's much more uh just social and warm and very in tune and they had uh had about a 12 hour window before flying out to an event and she got overwhelmed with a task and so she starts barking orders like barking oh my goodness and then they both slowed each other down and she was able to say I feel a lot of fear mm. that I'm not going to get all this done in 12 hours. Mm. And he just like melted in that mm. moment of her, her being so authentic. Yeah. And he came to her even physically, like just put yeah. his hand on her and, and like gave her that space, which is part of what we teach very much in the connection codes. And Glenn went and got it. It's called the Ooh. Mm, uh, actually. Yeah. Yeah. And this is one of the powerful tools, uh, which sounds very simple. Uh, we say there's a couple dozen versions of the OO, it's, but it's simply something audible. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of research on this. You know, Charity, if you are audible with Clinton when he shares something with you, you may be totally tuned into him, listening eye to eye, focused, nodding your head, but his brain tickles differently if you ooh him, if you're audible, and it doesn't have to be exactly pronounced capital O O O, but, <laughs> but literally where you're just with him and he can hear you, wow. where you're going, oh, wow, hmm, okay, yeah, I hear you. And this is why we say there's two or three dozen versions of it, but it's something audible so that the other person's brain registers that you're present with them. The other part of the ooh that's so powerful is it gives me something to do. So that Phyllis is sharing something, and this is why we say it's always the correct response. I may not even agree with Phyllis. I may not even get it. I may not even understand it. The ooh is not agreeing. The ooh is just me letting her know, oh, okay, wow, yeah, I hear you. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't make any sense to me. I, I don't experience it that way, but I hear it that that's what happens. Yeah. Wow. So wow. we go to Amazon.com, get an extra large box of ooze, uh, because you're going to need it. <laughs> You put them in your pocket and on your glove box, on the counter, everywhere. Because we want you using them all the time. If you follow Phyllis me around, we go through half a box of ooze before lunch uh, every day. Uh, because we're just doing each other all the time. And it's very, very uh, organic. It's spontaneous. It may sound funny, you know, actually having a, a sheet of paper. But in reality, that's just how we roll. Well, and going back to the couple that I was talking about, you know, her emotion in that moment of being overwhelmed, she had a very large emotion, a very high emotion. And where he was experienced all the things that needed to be done before they yeah. left town, as in, well, that's just three hours of stuff and we've got 12 hours. Yeah. But it wasn't until she was able to express her fear of not getting it done yeah. that he was able to understand why she seemed so out of control. Yeah. And then he was able to just touch her and actually give the space mm -hmm. to hear her. And even her getting that out brought her down right. to a level where she was able to, which is part of some of the stuff that we teach that, you know, uh, unprocessed emotion really hinders cognition. So mm -hmm. she was so out of it that her cognition wasn't clear. Mm -hmm. And then he, when he heard her, then they were co-regulating the mm -hmm. emotion. And then together 
it was like they were able to formulate a plan of really how to get all these things done in three hours. And then they actually had nine hours to spare, mm -hmm. but it was such a, instead of a fight, right. it was a, it was a connector. Yeah. Yeah. So the, Ooh, is the first of what we call the three phrases. The three phrases are, Ooh, what's happening. I missed it. And again, we say go to amazon.com, get the extra large box, get a smaller box of what happens and a little box if I missed it. So literally all day long, Clinton and Charity, you know, Charity conveys something to Clinton, and he literally goes, oh, so so what happened for you? Mm. There, what, what did I miss? And it becomes organic, because uh, it sounds weird to say all these three phrases, you use them over and over again, but you do. And that's what Phyllis and I do all day long, and if you watch this, you would not think that it was, you know, rote or, you know, monotonous, because we just breathe this way. Yeah. Well, I'm on an all day quest to, mm. to discover her, to find her, mm. find out what's happening with her. It is very much mutual. If she's finding out what's happening with me at the core, mm. uh, and we talk about a position of vulnerability, so I'm not attacking her. Although even if there's an attack, I mean, if Phyllis walked in the room and she screamed, which well, she doesn't scream, but if she ever screamed at me and said, you're an idiot, I literally would use the three phrases. I would go, oh, goodness, mm. babe, what, what's what's happening for you here? What, what am I missing? That's painful for me to hear that from you. I'm authentic, but I want to find out what's happening for her. And she'll process that very, very quickly. Wow. And she'll probably come back two minutes later and say, I feel some guilt that I called you an idiot because that wasn't fair. That's not accurate. Um, and again, even when she wow. says that, I'm going to go, oh, so what happens with the guilt there? What, what am I missing? And she'll tell me and we'll process that through. What's stunning to me, yeah. Phyllis and I, the last five years, we've actually, we actually keep track of this. We don't write it down on the calendar, but we have disconnected three or less times a year. We used oh. to disconnect three times before breakfast. Yeah, sure. We, we <laughs> have been there. They overlapped. I mean, we, we were always disconnected, literally for years. I mean, week after month, after year after year after year. Now we ver very, very rarely ever disconnect mm -hmm. our tense moments rarely last for more than 30 seconds wow. that blows my mind if you said that to me 30 years ago i'd have punched in the face but you wouldn't have been born there i don't think but whatever um, <laughs> if you were a baby i wouldn't punch but um i because i would have thought you were making fun of me you know 30 years ago if you said to me hey dude you know you you could process stuff with your wife in 30 mm -hmm. seconds or less i'd have been like shut up you're number one you're an idiot number two you're just cruel because I knew what we lived. I knew the level of pain. And I would be sitting there going, well, you think we're doing this voluntarily? You think we're just making this up for fun? Yeah. This is unbearable. This is, you know, again, I'd signed a 70 year contract. So this is just so overwhelming. But anyway, so you use those three phrases and, and back to your question, Charity, um, because you're just on an investigation to find out what's happening with Clinton and vice versa. He's just going to find out what's happening with you. And I have learned this woman probably more in the last two years mm. than all the, our time together before. That blows me away. I had no idea who she was. Mm. And I'm more mesmerized than ever because she has become more and more authentic mm. uh, with me, which if you'd asked me two and a half years ago, I'd be like, oh my gosh, yeah, Phyllis is, she's authentic all the time. She, she just lets me know what's happening. And I mean, literally, it's every like six weeks now. I'm like, oh, wow. So this is who my partner is. Well, hey, uh -huh. vice versa. I mean, she is getting to know me deeper and deeper, which is, mm -hmm. I don't know. Love that. There are so many amazing things that you said. I was like, we were writing down notes. Oh, and taking so many notes. I just, I love, I love multiple things. Um, One, I love the quest to discover one another because mm. I think we have this tendency to want to fix one another. And the reason we want to fix one another is because we're uncomfortable with our own emotions, right? And I'm just speaking for me, like, this is how I was in our relationship. I got uncomfortable. I just wanted to fix him. And then we can move on because I was too uncomfortable with the emotion, right? And I think just this beautiful picture of we weren't designed to fix our spouse. Like, we can never fix our spouse. Um, only God can. And he, that is his role to be a healer. And just the, the picture that I just kept getting is just like, man, this is intimacy. This is how God created mm. intimacy. This is how God created marriage. Like what you guys are describing oh. is being so authentic and mm. with each other in this safe place to share emotion and then just sit there with them and love them mm. regardless. Well, and mm -hmm. you guys, 
are just a beautiful picture of that. And it gives me goosebumps as I say right now, because I'm just really, really grateful for you too. And everything that you guys shared on this podcast and um, just so, so blessed. So thank you guys so much. You know, what's, what's amazing is you guys, we, we, so we had, our listeners don't know this, right? But we had all these questions about sex. We were going to dive into, we were going to talk about, and they were going to be awesome. And they were going to make people uncomfortable as they heard them. It was going to be fantastic. It was going to relate, but you know, it was getting comfortable. It's like, oh my gosh, this is me. Do they know my story? And, and it was going to be fantastic. But w- what you said early on in, was that the emotional connection creates a groundwork yeah. for sexual yeah. connection. Mm-hmm. And this podcast, even though we had the idea that we were going to go over here and talk about sex and all these things, we needed to preface with this. And yeah. so, and yeah. so hopefully in my mind, I'm like, we got to have you guys back on. We got to do another podcast part two, because yeah. this is going to flow into that. We're going to take everything we said today and we're going to go great guys. Now, how does this go into sex? How do these things affect sex and that connection yeah. and communication and emotions? Because we have these emotions like you talked about Phyllis that are going off and they're in all parts of our life with our kids, with parenting, with our jobs, with finances, but I think a huge area that we don't know how to communicate the most about is our sexuality. And right. so, and so I wish we had more time today. We don't, we're out of time, but I just am like, okay, we got to have you guys back on. We got to do part two. It's got to be about sex. Well, can, can I do a 30 something. second plug real quick? Of course. Yeah, yeah of course. Because I do want people to know that number two, I'm a, a clinical sexologist, but number one, I'm a human. It is stunning to me because our culture says this couple's going to be hot and horny, they're going to marry, then it's going to dissipate in some level of blondness. I'm 60 years old. It blows my mind. Mm. I'm hornier than ever. And it <laughs> amazes me the level of our dynamic sexual connection is greater than ever. I did not know that was a thing. And our culture says it's not. And we want to be a gentle voice screaming in people's ears that not only is this real, not only does it exist, it's doable. Mm. It's amazing to me. Yeah. And I encourage you the next you know, month, go interview a bunch of 60 year olds and say, how dynamic is your sexual connection in your marriage? And I'll give you a dollar for every one of them you find that go, oh my gosh, it's phenomenal. Mm. Because our culture says there's no such thing. Mm. You know, they're, they're old, they're past it. No, we're, we're picking up speed. We're actually getting good at this. Mm-hmm. And it's really is awesome. Which is exactly why we need to have you back on. I'm not just yeah. saying that. Yeah, no. So yeah. you guys, this has been amazing. Okay. How can our listeners find out all that you guys are doing? I know we talked about so many things yeah. Talk about the webinar. I know I want them to hear about the, um, late night. about the late night coming on. I want to hear about the, yeah. the, uh, what was it? The core emotion. Wheel. So, yeah, in a nutshell, you know, obviously you're going to share our website. So, kind of, we love to think about it uh, conquering conflict in marriage, which leads to peace. And when you have an environment of peace in your home, it brings so much life and energy. And that's why the foundation of emotional connection is, is so huge to lead into dynamic sexual connection. And we do have an event coming up on February 10th. You do have to sign up, but it's free. And it's a kind of a sneak peek. It's a one night, one hour called Late Night 101. It's all about sex. And uh, it's it'll be a, a lot of fun. And it kind of leads you down a road of realizing, okay, my goodness, they've got a lot to say about it. And uh, we have we offer e courses. So the the one that I we recommend that you start with is called Foundations, and it just gives you and teaches you the tools that we alluded to tonight. You know the core motion wheel and the ooh and co regulating and um, processing emotion. Like it's all in our Foundations e course, and we want everyone to kind of start there before you dive into yeah. sex. Let's start there. Let's yes, get the please. emotional connection right. really strong right. in your marriage. Because then the sexual connection, you will have the language and you will be able to explore and expand and just have a lot, a lot of fun with that. So, yeah. And, you know, we, we have a great uh, Instagram um, community. We post a lot of stuff and a lot of educational information through our Instagram. So we love it when that as well is mentioned, just because that's where we get out most of our you know, daily and every couple of days, um, teachings. Wow. 
We're so, so excited. Thank I hope you all these so listeners much. plug in. I hope yes. everyone listening to this plugs in, checks that out. Those are so many free resources. You have no excuse when it's free, right? You have no right. excuse. Come on. Right. And we got to prioritize yeah. this stuff instead of all the other stuff that we prioritize, man. How many of us watch TV and are on our phones doing mindless things? And let's get on those Instagrams that are adding value and on those different webinars. You guys are, you guys are doing some great stuff. So thank you so much for being with us. We, we're just grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. It's amazing. Yeah.